So uh, last time here we uh, last time here we did talk about uh, types of reactions, which is kind of what you're going to be doing in the lab today, which are uh, double displacement reactions. And pretty much uh, double displacement reactions are, as we talked about last time, really the big sort of category of reactions um, <clears throat> for which more specific classifications can be given. In general, a double displacement reaction can be pretty much recognized by the reaction of two ionic compounds, positive, negative, positive, negative guy. And always when you have two ionic compounds like this, uh, basically, what happens is the two positive guys do switch partners, as we talked about. And really, in this case, A would go over here and C would come over here. And it will make two new ionic compounds. And double displacement reactions really cover sort of uh, two reasons why a reaction takes place. Um, one of the reasons why a reaction takes place is really the formation of a solid. And those are what are referred to as precipitation reactions because they make a precipitate. That means obviously one of these guys basically become a solid. So I think at the end last time we talked about solubility rules, which you could use to determine uh, whether or not when you put together two ionic guys, uh, two ions, uh, which is referred to as a precipitate, are will they be soluble in each other, which means that they will not form a solid and they will be aqueous. Double displacement reactions also take care of uh, really the second reason why a reaction takes place, which is really the formation of water. And that occurs during acid and base reactions. And in that case, obviously one of these guys becomes water. We'll also get into today the sort of the third reason why reactions take place, which are covered under what are referred to as redox reactions. And that is basically an electron transfer. So pretty much all reactions boil down to one of those three things occurring. You make a solid, electrons are being transferred, our water is being formed. So you could think of double displacement reactions, as we'll talk about a little bit later on here today, redox reactions as really kind of the big categories of types of reactions for which underneath each of those sort of big categories, uh, you can kind of more specifically classify a reaction, you know, based on maybe what you are looking at. You know, when we look at double displacement reactions, we also talked about writing three important types of reactions, uh, one being the molecular equation. And again, in the molecular equation, we write everything out just like we have with our formulas here. So we put everything together properly, like silver nitrate and a little potassium chloride. Again, positive, negative, positive, negative. Silver comes over here. Potassium comes over there. And that gives us KNO3 and some silver chloride in this case, which would be a solid based on our solubility rules that we talked about. That's the molecular equation. And as we talked about, really what happens when we kind of put it together, say in a beaker or something like that, things that are strong electrolytes that we talked about uh, are things that will really break apart completely in solution. Uh, things that are weak electrolytes will stay together and things that are solid and liquid will stay together. So we can write what is sometimes referred to as the total ionic equation. And that would be taking everything in the top equation there and breaking apart into its ions. So silver nitrate will break apart into a silver ion and a nitrate ion. Potassium chloride will break apart into a potassium ion and a chloride ion. Potassium nitrate, also a strong electrolyte, will break apart into a potassium and a nitrate. And our silver chloride will stay together because it is a solid, so it will not break apart. <clears throat> so once again, when we write this equation, it's important a couple of things. Anything that is an ion does need to have a charge. And obviously anything that is solid, liquid, or gas, or again, a weak electrolyte, you really do not break apart. 
when we get to this equation here, we could find ions that look exactly the same on both sides. So in this case, potassium and nitrate look exactly the same on both sides. And those guys that look the same on both sides are again, what are referred to as we talked about as spectator ions. Uh, they really are there, but they're not really forming any product. Uh, they're just there to kind of balance out the charge. In this case, they're actually still just floating around in the solution part of it or liquid part of it. What we do with those is they should completely cancel out on both sides. And that leaves us our third type of equation, which is the net ionic equation. And that is in this reaction, what is happening is the silver ion will go find the chloride ion and they will make a little silver chloride here. <clears throat> Any questions on that stuff we talked about, I think last time. Again, we use the solubility rules to help us decide whether or not obviously a solid would form. A reminder that if something is soluble, based on solubility rules, those are the guys that get the aqueous symbol next to them. And if they are insoluble, based on solubility rules. Those are the guys that get the solid symbol next to it. Yeah, <clears throat> people always get confused, like soluble should be S, yeah, but it's not. So S is a solid in this case for things that are insoluble. Any questions on any of that stuff there? <clears throat> okay, so we talked about precipitation reactions last time. So let's talk a little bit about acid base reactions, but I don't think we did. Um, so acid and base reactions are still double displacement reactions. So again, these guys really do still fall under the double displacement. A little bit about an acid. Acid have sour taste. They change litmus paper uh, to red. So I think in the other experiment, you use some litmus paper and pretty much whenever litmus paper turns red, uh, it means it's acidic. Um, it reacts with metals to produce hydrogen gas. So I think the uh, last experiment there, you did a little magnesium hydrochloric acid, right? Put your thumb over it, took your lightest splint, it barked at you, hopefully, or something like that. And you blew out it before it got to your fingers. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, the reaction is very common. Aqueous acids are, will also conduct electricity. So strong acids are also strong electrolytes. So they 100% break apart. There is sort of a list of strong acids, which again is uh, good to know. So some strong acids, as we might have talked about last time, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, perchloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydriotic acid. So those are some really, some strong acids uh, they're strong electrolytes. They 100% break apart in solution. So when you have something like HCl, it breaks apart into H plus and Cl minus because it 100% breaks apart into ions. It produces a lot of H plus, which is essentially the definition of an acid is the ability to produce H plus ions in solution. Um, bases, on the other hand, uh, have bitter taste. They feel slippery. Uh, typically, litmus paper will turn blue if it's basic. And also, there are some strong bases. A lot of group one and group two that has hydroxide in it are strong bases like KOH, sodium hydroxide. You know, you could go over the calcium hydroxide and kind of down strontium hydroxide, barium hydroxide. So uh, those are typically your strong bases. <clears throat> If it's an acid and it's not on that list there, it's probably fairly safe to assume that it's going to be a weak acid. So just some common weak acids we sometimes come across, uh, hydrofluoric acid, acetic acid, nitrous acid, carbonic acid. In terms of the weak base, Probably the most common weak base is NH3, which is ammonia. Uh, you see a lot uh, in chemistry. So in this application, obviously, if it's a strong acid or strong base, when you get to the total ionic equation, you would completely break it apart. 
Uh, if it's a weak acid or weak base, you would actually keep it together and not break it apart uh, when you write that total ionic equation. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? So as I mentioned before, an acid is something that has the ability to produce H plus ions in solution, which are hydrogen ions. They are sometimes referred to as protons. In addition, when we talk about acids and bases, H3O plus, which is the hydronium ion, and H plus is pretty much the same deal. Uh, it's basically what makes something more acidic or less acidic in solution. So as we see there, if you have something like nitric acid in solution, 100% of what you have in that solution is just H pluses and nitrate ions floating around. You have none of those units still together. And because it produces, again, a lot of free H plus in that solution, uh, that's definitely what's going to make it a, a strong acid. Uh, just pretty much needs to go for a swim to do so, and it will produce a lot of H plus really quickly. Now, bases, on the other hand, again, are things that have that ability to produce OH minus ions in solution. That should be a plus here. And once again, they will pretty much break apart 100%. And again, if you look on the periodic table, kind of like where sodium is, come over to calcium and down. Any of those guys with some hydroxide are, are typically in group one or group two uh, going to be strong ones. So same idea, if you had some sodium hydroxide in solution, 100% of what you would have in that solution, sodium ions floating around and hydroxide ions floating around. And once again, because it's able to produce a lot of free OH minus, and that's really the key to it being sort of a strong acid or strong base, is the ability to produce free H plus or free OH minus, not attached to anything else, just floating around freely in the solution is what makes something sort of a strong acid or strong base. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about the reaction of a strong acid and a strong base. Pretty much no matter what combination of strong acid and strong base that you put together, you will always produce pretty much the same thing. You will produce a strong acid plus a strong base will produce a salt plus water. A salt and ionic compound water obviously is h2o so that is ultimately what you get no matter sort of what you combo together you could take any combination of a strong acid and a strong base and that's pretty much what it'll end up with so for example if we took some <clears throat> nitric acid and reacted it with some sodium hydroxide this is a strong acid, that is a strong base. This is actually still a double displacement reaction because the positive, negative, positive and negative. So what's gonna happen here is the H plus and the OH minus will come together to make water. And then the positive sodium and the negative nitrate will come together to make sodium nitrate. And this is our water and our salts in this case. Now, if we take this reaction and we break it apart into the total ionic equation, because nitric acid is a strong acid, it will break apart into H plus and NO3 minus. Because sodium hydroxide is a strong electrolyte and a strong base, it will break apart into sodium ion and hydroxide ion. The water, which is a liquid, will stay together. Otherwise, it wouldn't be together. And our sodium nitrate will also break apart into Na plus and uh, NO3 minus in this case. And that would be obviously our total ionic equation. And that obviously up here would be our molecular equation. From this, we could look and we could see our spectator ions here and our spectator ions. Maybe. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we have a nitrate. On the right-hand side, we have a nitrate. 
right hand side we have a sodium left hand side we have a sodium those are our spectator ions that will cancel out and that leaves us our net ionic equation that we see there which is h plus plus oh minus makes water again water being one of the reasons why a reaction takes place so that's basically what is happening here that is also why Reactions are called acid-based neutralization reactions because they basically form water in this case. So pretty much any combination of strong acid, strong base you put together, that's your net ionic equation at the end. That is basically what it's going to basically end up is the H plus from the acid, the OH minus from the base will come together basically and form water. Any questions on that there? Yeah. So uh, no, as long as it's a strong acid, strong base, that's what you're going to get. Now we talked a little bit about, you know, there's, you know, if you have like a weak acid. So for example, let's say we did this same sort of reaction, uh, but we use uh, HF, which is a weak acid. So when we take HF and react it with sodium hydroxide, which again is a strong base, we will get some NAF and some water and once again that is our double displacement happening positive negative positive negative this guy coming over here to make water this guy coming over here to make sodium fluoride remember as well i think we might have talked about it last time but if you are sort of predicting what goes on the other side of the arrow you want to make sure you get the right formulas down first right before you balance it so don't try to do those things together get the right formulas like you're doing nomenclature then go back with the coefficients and balance it now, when we get to the total ionic equation, because this guy is a weak electrolyte, what that means is it basically will stay together in solution. So you would actually not break him apart in this case, and you would keep it together. You would still break apart the sodium hydroxide because it's a strong base. You would still break apart the sodium fluoride because it's a strong electrolyte and you would keep together the water in this case. And that would be your total ionic equation, which now if you look on both sides in terms of spectator ions, it is actually in this case, just the sodium that's the spectator ion. So we really only have the sodium as a spectator ion here that will go apart. And that will leave us a net ionic equation that looks a little bit different when we have a weak acid involved or even a weak base will look kind of similar. And we will have this as our net ionic equation here. And the difference is, again, is a weak acid will basically stay together when it goes for a swim. Uh, it won't break apart uh, all that much. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so strong acid, strong base, 100%, that is what you're going to get. If you introduce some type of weak acid or weak base, you will still have that weak acid or weak base still there in the net ionic equation together because you shouldn't break it apart. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so here's a couple other ones here are sodium, uh, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, again, making our water and our salts. And again, you can see with this one as well, as you go through it, it is going to be our sodium as spectator ions or chloride as spectator ions. So ultimately here, our acid providing the H plus, our OH minus come from the base to form that water. I would say in most cases, our salts that you form based on solubility rules are probably going to be uh, soluble. Again, if you think about solubility rules, which one of them is pretty much everybody in group one is soluble. So that covers anytime you have sodium hydroxide there or potassium hydroxide. So a lot of times, uh, pretty much your salt's going to be a soluble salt, uh, which means it will break apart and still be floating around in the solution. <clears throat> Any questions on acid base reactions? So again, they still fall under that double displacement umbrella. So now we're gonna to move to the other big classification, which once again are redox reactions and redox reactions stand for oxidation and reduction reactions. And there's actually a couple of types of definitions for oxidation and reduction. Uh, for oxidation, pretty much 
we use the definition that it loses electrons, while reduction means that is somebody that has gained electrons. Some people like uh, Leo the lion goes grr, loss of electrons, oxidation, gaining of electrons, reduction. Others are popular of the oil rig. Yes, oxidizing is losing, reducing is gaining. You can put them together, put Leo the lion on the oil rig, he'll go grr, and you know, has to choose. Now, there is a couple other definitions of oxidation and reduction uh, that we really don't use too much in general chemistry. Um, more so if you go to organic chemistry, you use them. The other definitions of oxidation is that something has gained oxygen as you go from reactants to products, or it has lost hydrogen as you again go from reactants to products. And the opposite definitions here for reduction, something that has lost oxygen as it goes from reactants to products and something that has gained hydrogen as it goes from reactants to products. So a lot of times they will use these definitions in organic chemistry because you deal with a lot of non-metal, non-metal action. Uh, but since we have a lot of metals and stuff like that, a lot of times we look at uh, losing or gaining electrons. <clears throat> so how do you know if something is sort of losing or gaining electrons or going through oxidation or reduction? A lot of times what we look at is what is referred to as the oxidation state or number. And it's important to know that the oxidation state or number is not always the charge we think about for elements uh, when they're in ionic compound. So when we talk about ionic compounds, when we have a metal and a non-metal that comes together, we have certain charges like sodium is plus one and magnesium is plus two. Fluorine is minus one in that situation. Or is minus two. So, in an ionic compound, uh, the charge that you associate with that element is the same thing as its oxidation state. Where it does get a little bit different is when you're dealing with molecular compounds where things are sharing electrons. When things are sharing electrons based on who they're sharing electrons with and the electronegativity of everybody involved, things that we normally, for example, think of as like negative one or minus one, can become more of a positive sort of oxidation state. So for example, chlorine is a good example. In an ionic compound, it is always gonna be minus one, but if it's in a covalent compound where everybody's sharing electrons, it could have a positive oxidation state. I plus two plus seven, sort of what it is bound to. So there are some rules to help us decide or sort of assign oxidation states. And I'll just give you sort of the quick rundown of it. Usually oxygen is a great place to start with. Uh, it usually has an oxidation state of minus two. Unless it's peroxide, which is this guy, then it's minus one. And that's peroxide, like in the hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen is usually plus one unless it is the negative version, which is hydride, which is minus one. Uh, fluorine is usually minus one. Uh, things that are their normal sort of charge, like ions with by themselves or whatever their charge is, is their oxidation number. So this could help us really understand, you know, if something is kind of going through oxidation or reduction. And by the way, the total oxidation state or oxidation numbers of everyone should equal the charge on the ion. So if it is an ion and it does have a charge, everything should add up to whatever the overall charge is or it should add up to zero if it's neutral, or zero if it's neutral. So when you add up all the oxidation numbers for everybody involved, if it is like a polyatomic ion, for example, it should add up to whatever the charge is on the polyatomic ion, or if the thing is a neutral molecule, it should add up to zero when you take everybody into account. 
So a lot of times people have struggle with, you know, what is being oxidized, what is being reduced. And there's sort of a simple sort of number line approach you could take, which is makes it really simple. I believe on number line, there's zero and there's positive numbers to the right, negative numbers to the left, I hope still. And talk about what happens when somebody loses electrons. Do they become more positive or more negative? They do become more positive, right? Because they lost electrons. They have more protons than electrons. So if you see going from the left-hand side of the arrow to the right-hand side of the arrow, that element's oxidation number becomes more positive, moves in this direction. It is going through oxidation. When somebody gains electrons, they become more negative because they now have more negative charged electrons than protons. So if you look at the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the arrow, that element is kind of moving in this direction in terms of their oxidation state, becoming more negative. It is going through reduction. The nice thing about it is it always occurs together. So if something gets oxidized, something else gets reduced. And the nice thing is if you could just figure out one of those, like I know this is being oxidized by default, the other guy is being reduced and vice versa. So that makes it relatively easier in that sense. So for example, let's take a look at one that you did the other day, I think. You took some magnesium ribbon, right? You put it into a Bunsen burner and you were to observe what happens without looking at it. My favorite instructions ever, like observe what happens, but don't look at it. If you looked at it, it was very bright. Yes. Did you guys do that individually? He's a brave guy. All right. <laughs> so it got very, very bright when you did that, right? All right. So when we look at this reaction here, we could assign oxidation states. The other important rule for oxidation state is actually the first one here, which is anything that is by itself, uncombined, has an oxidation state of zero. So any element that's basically in its natural state, not combined with any other element, will always have an oxidation state of zero. So if we look at magnesium there on the left-hand side of the arrow, it is by itself, it is uncombined, it has an oxidation state of zero. The oxygen is oxygen gas, that is naturally how it comes, which means it also has an oxidation state of zero. Remember when the magnesium here and the oxygen get together, that's actually when those things gain charges to make an ionic compound, right? Metal, non-metal, that's actually what happens. And at that point on the right-hand side here, the magnesium ends up with an oxidation state of plus two. The oxygen ends up with a minus two oxidation state. So if we were to use our number line here to figure out what is going on, we'll start with the magnesium. Magnesium started at zero on the left-hand side, right? And on the right-hand side, it ended at plus two, which means it is moving in that direction. That means the magnesium is being oxidized or reduced. It is being oxidized. Yeah. By default, that's pretty much all I need to know that it is this guy here that is being reduced. But we could do the same thing for the oxygen. Oxygen on the left-hand side is starting at zero and ending on the right-hand side at minus two, which means it's moving in that direction. It's becoming more negative and it is going through reduction in this case. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, here, it should equal the charge on the, on the ion if it's an ion, or zero if it's a neutral compound. Yeah, if it's a neutral compound. Other questions? <clears throat> so in this case, what's happening is the magnesium is like giving away its electrons over there, and it is to the oxygen. By the way, this is always what should happen in an ionic compound, because as we talked about, metals should always lose electrons, which means they should be oxidized. Non-metals should always gain electrons, which means they should be reduced. So whenever you have an ionic compound, metal and non-metal, that is always how it should end up. Metal should be oxidized. Non-metal should be reduced. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Now, if we look at that reaction that we just talked about, which is our 
magnesium plus our oxygen making this guy here. We can uh, basically break this guy apart uh, into two, what are referred to as half reactions, the magnesium here going to a couple of magnesiums with a plus two. And this is gonna be four electrons coming off. This guy's gonna have four electrons plus an oxygen coming here to two of these. So why did I write it like this? This is the oxidation half reaction. And because it's the oxidation half reaction, that means it has lost electrons. And always in the oxidation half reaction, you will find electrons on the product side, like they're being given off. So whenever you're writing a reaction to imply that it is losing electrons, like an oxidation, electrons should always be on the right-hand side. Or if you see an equation where electrons are on the right-hand side, it tells you that that thing is going through oxidation. The other one would be the reduction half reaction. And the electrons are on always the product side. And that, is, I'm sorry, the reactive side, because that is like it is gaining those electrons. So it is gaining those electrons. So you always find the electrons on the reactant side and a reduction half reaction and an oxidation half reaction will be on the product side. They are called half reactions because technically speaking, it is half of what's going on in each of them. And if you add them together, these two reactions, the electrons should always cancel out. They're on opposite sides of the arrow and they're the exact same amount of electrons. That is because it's like a perfect transfer of electrons. So however many electrons somebody loses should be the exact same number of electrons that somebody gains. And that's why in these half reactions, before you add them together, you always need to make sure you have the same number of electrons on both sides. What you do now is basically everybody on the left-hand side stays on the left-hand side of the arrow in both reactions. And everybody on the right-hand side stays on the right-hand side. And that would give you two magnesiums and two O2 minuses, which will come together to make two of these guys here, right? Uh, when they come together. <clears throat> so that is the overall reaction from the and always when you have the half reactions, you wanna make sure that you put them back together uh, in a way that those electrons cancel each other out. That does require sometimes you to multiply a half reaction by a number or maybe both of them by a number. Uh, so for example, if we had <clears throat> say this, uh, where we took like a sodium here and we took like a chlorine here By the way, which one is the oxidation half reaction? It is the first one, right? Because the electrons are on the right-hand side, so it's losing electrons. This would be the oxidation half reaction. By the way, we know that because it's going from zero to plus one, right? Becoming more positive on your number line there, going to the right-hand side. This is our reduction because electrons are on the left-hand side there. We also know that because this is zero and this is minus one in terms of the oxidation state. So becoming more negative as it goes from one side to the next. And that is the definition of reduction. <clears throat> so in this case, before we could add these guys back together, we actually would need to multiply the top reaction by two to make sure that we have the same number of electrons on each of those half reactions. That would give us two sodiums, two sodiums with a plus and two electrons. Now we're good to go to add those reactions back together. Once again, electrons should cancel. The only way the electrons should cancel is two things. They should be the same number in each one they should always be on opposite sides of the arrows. Yeah, so you should never have two half reactions where the electrons are on the same side because something's wrong. That means you either have two reductions happening or two oxidations happening. It always got to be an oxidation and reduction, which means the electrons always has to be on opposite sides of the arrow. Once again, everybody on the left stays on the left. 
And everybody on the right stays on the right. And once again, these would come together to make two sodium chlorides, basically. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Now, uh, again, sometimes you may not have to multiply any half reactions. Sometimes you may have to multiply one, and sometimes you may have to multiply both half reactions by a number to get the electrons to cancel uh, out. <clears throat> So once again, uh, here is our electrons being transferred. Uh, once again, if we look at this zero, zero oxidation state, plus one and minus one. So once again, if you do your little layup here, our sodium starting at zero, ending at plus one, becoming more positive. So it is being oxidized. Our chlorine starting at zero, ending at minus one, becoming more negative, it is being reduced. By the way, when you're asked if something is being oxidized or reduced, it's always the reactants that you answer as the answer. It's the guys on the left-hand side of the arrow. Uh, it's always the guys that you get oxidized or reduced. Once again, this is what we would expect to happen because this is a metal and non-metal, so we would expect the metal to lose electrons and go through oxidation. And in this case, we expect the non-metal to pick up the electrons and go through reduction and come together. So once again, basically what is happening here are electrons being transferred. Now, in this case, when we look at something like Cl, <clears throat> Cl minus, it is minus one like we normally think about it. If we looked at something like chlorate, for example, Chlorate's a polyatomic ion where they are sharing electrons, right? Those nonmetals are actually sharing electrons. If we do a little Lewis structure throwback, uh, that's like 18, 19, 26. So if you drew the Lewis structure, it looks something like a this. Something like this. Overall thing, right, has a minus one charge. So in this particular case, if we were to assign our oxidation numbers, not blank out the screen, but just assign our oxidation. Once again, we would start with oxygen, which is minus two. This guy would also be a minus two oxidation state. And that would be a minus two oxidation state. That gives us like a minus six for all the oxygens. Overall, this thing has a minus one charge which means in order for our guide to get an overall minus one charge, and we have a minus six for all the oxygens, the one chlorine in this case has what oxidation state? Plus, plus five in this case. It has a plus five in this case, gives us, when you take those together, minus one. So this guy is carrying a plus five charge, which is definitely different than when we think about chlorine in an ionic compound. In an ionic compound, what's happening is all those electrons are completely transferred and it picks up basically one electron. In this situation, there is no transfer of electrons, but they're sharing electrons. Oxygen being a little bit more electronegative is going to pull the electrons closer to the oxygen, right? And when it pulls the electrons closer to the oxygen, sharing unequally those electrons, this guy becomes more and more electron deficient and it becomes more positively charged. So in a covalent situation, this chlorine can take on a positive sort of charge because of who it's attached to and the electronegativity difference of everybody. So that's how oxidation state, again, is a slightly different than what we think about normal charges, especially with covalent compounds where there's electrons being shared. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> By the way, you don't have to draw it to assign oxidation states. You just go to the formula and go oxygen is minus two. That's minus six equals minus one plus five. So you can just do it from the formula. You don't have to actually draw it or anything like that. That, by the way, is why the thing has a overall charge of minus one, this polyatomic ion because of the unequal sharing of the electrons with the chlorine in the center, it turns that chlorine into a positive five charge and that leaves you that minus one charge left over. So when we talked about the polyatomic ions and why these things are kind of sharing electrons, but still have a charge, it's because of that really unequal sharing of those electrons 
creates that overall charge that occurs uh, for each of those guys. Any questions on that? <clears throat> okay. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, here's our uh, sort of uh, magnesium example here of <clears throat> our oxidation reduction that we talked about a second ago. So we won't look too close here. By the way, in this particular case here, right, uh, there are four electrons in the balanced equation because each magnesium is going to lose how many electrons? Two, and there's two of them, right? So that's where the four electrons come from. So that's why it's balanced. And there's actually two oxygens, right? They're going to pick up two electrons each, and that's why they both become minus two charged. So uh, that's how we get the four electrons, basically, in this particular case. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, uh, looking at this, uh, you can use those other definitions of either gaining oxygen or losing oxygen. In this particular case, if we look at the sulfur, as it goes from left to right, it actually gained oxygen, it went from two to three. That means that this is going to be oxidized. And by default, that guy would be reduced. So I tell you what, why don't you take a moment here and assign oxidation states for each of the elements that are there and see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look. So once again, uh, we're going to start with oxygen, which is minus two here is the oxidation state. There are two of them, which gives us like a minus four. The SO2 is neutral, which means when we add up all of our total oxidation numbers, they need to equal zero. In this case, then the sulfur would carry what type of oxidation state? It would carry a plus four to get it to zero, right? So it actually will carry a plus four oxidation state here by sharing electrons with the oxygen. Plus four minus four gives us zero. The oxygen here is zero, right? There is naturally how it comes. Coming to the other side here, uh, we have the oxygen, which would be minus two, and there's three of them, which gives us minus six. Once again, the SO3 is equal, is neutral, which means it should equal zero. In this case, the sulfur carries what type of oxidation state? It would be a plus six to get us to zero, right? So plus six in this case. First off, any questions on how to assign any of those numbers then? Now, once again, just a reminder, this is naturally how the element oxygen comes. So that is why it's uncombined and that's why it's zero. When we look at what is happening with the sulfur in this particular case, the sulfur is starting at plus four and it's ending at plus six, which would be moving in that direction, which tells us exactly what we saw earlier, that it is the sulfur here that is going through oxidation or being oxidized. It is actually the oxygen here, and it's this oxygen. If we look at this oxygen, it is starting at zero and ending at minus two as it goes that way. And that means it's becoming more negative, which means this guy is going through reduction. The regular oxygen on each side is basically nothing happening, right? It's minus two and minus two, but is that molecular oxygen that is basically going to uh, zero to minus two. Any questions on that? We see that here sulfur, which we normally think about in an ionic compound as being negative two charge, can be in this case plus four or plus six. And the difference here is the number of oxygens, right? And the SO2, I won't draw it correctly or perfectly, but in the SO2, the electrons are coming this way, making this like a plus four sort of arrangement. When we get to SO3, adding that extra oxygen in there means there's an extra oxygen pulling those electrons away from the sulfur, making it even more electron deficient and more positively charged. And it ends up with a plus six sort of arrangement. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so again, redox being the sort of big category of ways to uh, put other classifications in, 
These again are the three real reasons why a reaction takes place. And as we talked about, the first two are really taken care of in a double displacement reaction. And again, here, what we're talking about right now is basically taken care of in our redox reactions. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at some more specific ways to classify some reactions. Obviously, to cover a couple from double displacement, uh, this is our double displacement reaction, positive, negative, positive, negative. These two guys are going to switch partners. And that gives us one guy here, which makes a solid or a precipitate. Hence why, again, we can more specifically call it a precipitation reaction, like you will do here today in lab. And we could also, again, classify it as a double displacement reaction. Once again, making that solid one of the reasons why the reaction took place. <clears throat> and we already talked about that, so we won't go into that again. Here's our acid-base reactions, which once again is, is why it is sometimes referred to as a neutralization reaction, making our water and our salt. Again, the formation of water here, the second reason why a reaction takes place. Once again, positive-negative, positive-negative, switching partners. Basically, the water comes from the H from the acid, the OH from the base. So if you scratch it out, put those guys together, that is always where the salt comes from, basically. So the salt, the salt really is your spectator ions. It's basically um, the other part of the acid and base that doesn't make water. All right, so let's talk about some of these other types of reactions. Obviously, above, as we can see here, it is a redox reaction. If we look at lithium and fluorine, that is zero and zero in terms of its oxidation state. When these guys come together, our lithium now will get a plus one charge and the fluorine will get a minus one charge. That is their normal charges because it's an ionic compound, so we don't have to worry about all the weird charges that occur. Once again here, if we follow what's going on, our lithium starting at zero and ending at plus one being oxidized, our fluorine starting at zero and ending at minus one becoming more negative and becoming reduced. So again, that being oxidized, and that being reduced. Now, this type of reaction that we see down here is what's referred to as a single replacement reaction and you've done that reaction. The lab just last week, I think you did the magnesium with the hydrochloric acid, right? Put your thumb on it, let the wood split, right? And a bark and all that. That is a single replacement reaction. Earlier on, when we did the halogens, the different layers and all that, and we got top layer changing to the bottom layer color and all that kind of stuff, uh, that was single replacement reactions. In a single replacement reaction, you basically have A plus B, C. The way you recognize this is if this is a metal, they will have no oxidation state. This will be an ionic compound. So you got like a metal and an ionic compound. What will happen is the metal will come in and kick out the positive guy. It will create a new ionic compound. That guy coming in will get a charge and the guy coming out will have no charge. You could also do this with a non-metal. So if this was a non-metal and an ionic compound, the non-metal will come in and kick out the negative guy because that's typical what non-metals make when they make charges. You will make a new ionic compound and the guy coming out will have no charge. Remember that whatever is coming in needs to be more reactive. Than what it is replacing. So whatever element is coming in needs to be more reactive than the element it's replacing for the reaction to take place. If it is not, then the reaction will not take place. You'll get a reaction. So for example, if you took the hydrochloric acid and you topped copper in there, which I think you did as well, I think. So you did some copper wire, right? And the HCl, you probably didn't see much happen. Copper is less reactive than hydrogen. So the reaction did not take place. We should know this reaction takes place because whenever you replace hydrogen, it comes off as its elemental form, which is hydrogen gas, which is the bubbles that you see when you did the reaction and really the gas you were trapping with your thumb when you put it over the uh, test tube. 
So if we look at this guy, that is what's happening here. The zinc is coming in and kicking out the hydrogen. When the hydrogen gets kicked out, it makes hydrogen gas. And that is definitely our single replacement. In terms of oxidation states, this guy has no charge in its natural state. This guy is plus one and minus one. Hydrogen has no charge, plus two for the zinc and minus one for the chloride there. This is also a redox reaction that's taking place. If we look at it, the zinc is starting at zero and ending at plus two. So the zinc is being oxidized. It is actually the hydrogen here that is starting at plus one and going to zero, becoming more negative. That is being reduced. The chloride on both sides, nothing's happening to it. It's basically saying the same in both cases. So this is a redox reaction. It is also a single replacement reaction. Most people would probably classify it as a single replacement reaction, but it could also be classified as a redox reaction. Now, I know we talk about sort of writing net ionic equations a lot for our sort of uh, double displacement reactions. You could also write it for this reaction as well. This would be zinc, which is a solid, which would stay together. The hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, would break apart. Our hydrogen, which is a gas, would stay together. And our zinc chloride would break apart. In this particular case, the spectator ion is only, is only the chloride. And it completely cancels out on both sides leaves us a net ionic equation of zinc plus the hydrogen, making our H2 and our zinc 2 plus. This net ionic equation is sometimes used a lot of times to represent the redox aspect of this reaction, where you could clearly see it's going from zero to plus two. This guy's going from plus one to zero in this case. So sometimes people will write net ionic equations to sort of demonstrate the uh, redox aspect of it and get rid of the spectator ion in this case. Any questions on any of that there? So as we've been talking about, you definitely could classify reactions in several different ways, depending on sort of what you're looking at. A combustion reaction, I would say in most cases, this is the type of combustion reaction most people talk about, which is the organic combustion, which basically an organic guy is carbon, hydrogens, or oxygen. Basically an organic combustion reaction, these are the three things you always get here. You have an organic guy, which like methane, which comes out of your, when you light a Bunsen burner, you always have O2 on the left, always produces CO2 and water, basically. This is propane, which is organic. Oxygen on the left, CO2 and water basically formed on the right-hand side. That is typically what you get in a combustion reaction. If you have an incomplete combustion, you could get like carbon monoxide, but most of the time is CO2 and water. Now, there is also a more general definition of a combustion reaction. And frankly, all the requirement is, is there's O2 present. So pretty much that's all you need. Technically speaking, to classify something as a combustion reaction, so if we looked at the one that we saw earlier like this, our magnesium plus our oxygen makes our magnesium oxide. <clears throat> this right here is definitely a redox reaction as we talked about. It is also could be classified as a combustion reaction because frankly, there's oxygen involved. And frankly, it could also be classified as we'll talk about here in a second, a synthesis our combination reaction because it's basically two things that make one thing. So this one reaction could be classified in three different ways, depending on sort of what you're looking at. I would say most people would classify it as a synthesis or combination reaction, but technically speaking, any one of the three is a correct classification of this type of reaction. So you could definitely classify the same reaction in multiple ways. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> 
All right, just to finish up the last couple of types of reactions, speaking of that one there that we just saw is a synthesis or combination reaction. In a synthesis or combination reaction, basically you take two things and you make one thing. Hence the combination part of it. So uh, if you take water, H2 and O2, put it together to make water. So two things make one thing, our sodium and our chlorine coming together to make one thing as the one we just did there, magnesium and oxygen coming together here uh, to make one thing. Uh, so two things make one thing, definitely. In all these cases, right, these are also all redox reactions as well, right? So they all fall in that. And this one here, really in this one here, combustion, because there is oxygen technically involved uh, as well. So anytime you have two things to make one thing, that is a combination or synthesis reaction. The opposite of that is really a decomposition reaction. And that's basically when you break it apart. So in a decomposition reaction, you basically start with one thing and break it apart into a couple of things. Now, uh, this is what you did the other day with the little tube and the little test tubes and the nine volt batteries provided you got one that was alive and not dead, right? And you plugged it in. When you did that, you ran electrical current through water. You basically broke it up from one thing into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas with the little bubbles that you saw in those little test tubes as they came through, hopefully. Uh, so this is a decomposition. It's basically the opposite of our one that we saw on the previous page, uh, which is our combination. So they're basically our opposites of each other. That's a combination reaction. We also see that they are both redox reactions. If we look at putting it together, this is zero, zero. Hydrogen here is plus one, oxygen is minus two. In the combination of making water, hydrogen is going from zero to plus one. It is being oxidized. Oxygen is going from zero to minus two, it is being reduced. So that's being oxidized, that is being reduced. What happens when we go the opposite way and we go from water to hydrogen in a decomposition reaction? This is plus one and minus two. This is zero and zero. Going the opposite way in your decomposition, the hydrogen is actually starting at plus one and ending at zero, which means it is actually being reduced and the oxygen is starting at minus two and ending at zero becoming more positive it is being oxidized because they are reversed of each other right one gets oxidized one gets reduced to put, bring it back apart the opposite has to happen basically any questions on that there yeah yeah so some most people call it synthesis People call it combination and some will call it both. So it's commonly referred to as either a synthesis or combination reaction. It's basically the same thing. Yeah, synthesis puts it together or combination, like comboing it something together, right? Putting it together. So combination or synthesis puts it together, decomposition breaks it apart. And just to finish up really quick here, to summarize the two big umbrellas, we had our double displacement. And again, under the double displacement is more specific classifications of precipitation reactions and acid-base reactions. And pretty much everybody else is under the redox umbrella. That's your synthesis, our combination reaction. That's your decomposition reaction. That's your single replacement reactions. And that is your combustion reactions. So under those two big umbrellas, pretty much fall all the most specific classifications you can have. Any questions on any of that? That wraps up this chapter here.